Section 25 of Emile. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Emile by Jean Jacques Rousseau. Translated by Barbara Foxley. Book 4, Part 6. Having arrived, I know not how, at the idea of substance, it is clear that to allow of a single substance, it must be assumed that this substance is endowed with incompatible and mutually exclusive properties, such as thought and size, one of which it is by its nature divisible and the other wholly incapable of division. Moreover, it is assumed that thought or, if you prefer it, feeling is a primitive quality inseparable from the substance to which it belongs, that its relation to the substance is like the relation between substance and size. Hence it is inferred that beings who lose one of these attributes lose the substance to which it belongs, and that death is, therefore, but a separation of substances, and that those beings in whom the two attributes are found are composed of the two substances to which those two qualities belong. But consider what a gulf there is between the idea of two substances and that of the divine nature, between the incomprehensible idea of the influence of our soul upon our body and the idea of the influence of God upon every living creature. The ideas of creation, destruction, ubiquity, eternity, almighty power, those of the divine attributes, these are all ideas so confused and obscure that few men succeed in grasping them, yet there is nothing obscure about them to the common people, because they do not understand them in the least. How then should they present themselves in full force, that is to say, in all their obscurity to the young mind which is still occupied with the first working of the senses, and fails to realize anything but what it handles. In vain do the abysses of the infinite open around us. A child does not know the meaning of fear. His weak eyes cannot gauge their depths. To children everything is infinite. They cannot assign limits to anything not that their measure is so large, but because their understanding is so small. I have even noticed that they place the infinite rather below than above the dimensions known to them. They judge a distance to be immense rather by their feet than by their eyes. Infinity is bounded for them, not so much by what they can see, but how far they can go. If you talk to them of the power of God, they will think he is nearly as strong as their father, as their own knowledge is in everything the standard by which they judge of what is possible. They always picture what is described to them as rather smaller than what they know. Such are the natural reasonings of an ignorant and feeble mind. Ajax was afraid to measure his strength against Achilles, yet he challenged Jupiter to combat, for he knew Achilles and did not know Jupiter. A Swiss peasant thought himself the richest man alive. When they tried to explain to him what a king was, he asked with pride, Has the king got a hundred cows on the high pastures? I am aware that many of my readers will be surprised to find me tracing the course of my scholar through his early years without speaking to him of religion. At fifteen he will not even know that he has a soul. At eighteen, even he may not be ready to learn about it, for if he learns about it too soon, there is the risk of his never really knowing anything about it. If I had to depict the most heartbreaking stupidity, I would paint a pedant teaching children the catechism. If I wanted to drive a child crazy, I would set him to explain what he has learned in his catechism. You will reply that as most of the Christian doctrines are mysteries, you must wait, not merely till the child is a man, but till the man is dead, before the human mind will understand those doctrines. To that I reply, that there are mysteries which the heart of man can neither conceive nor believe, 
and I see no use in teaching them to children unless you want to make liars of them. Moreover, I assert that to admit that there are mysteries, you must at least realize that they are incomprehensible, and children are not even capable of this conception. At an age when everything is mysterious, there are no mysteries properly so called. We must believe in God if we would be saved. This doctrine, wrongly understood, is the root of bloodthirsty intolerance and the cause of all the futile teachings which strikes a deadly blow at human reason by training it to cheat itself with mere words. No doubt there is not a moment to be lost if we would deserve eternal salvation, but if the repetition of certain words suffices to obtain it, I do not see why we should not people heaven with starlings and magpies as well as with children. The obligation of faith assumes the possibility of belief. The philosopher who does not believe is wrong, for he misuses the reason he has cultivated, and he is able to understand the truths he rejects. But the child who professes the Christian faith, what does he believe? Just what he understands. And he understands so little of what he is made to repeat, that if you tell him to say just the opposite, he will be quite ready to do it. The faith of children and the faith of many men is a matter of geography. Will they be rewarded for having been born in Rome rather than in Mecca? One is told that Mohammed is the prophet of God, and he says, Mohammed is the prophet of God. The other is told that Mohammed is a rogue, and he says, Mohammed is a rogue. Either of them would have said just the opposite had he stood in the other's shoes. When they are so much alike to begin with, can the one be consigned to paradise and the other to hell? When a child says he believes in God, it is not God he believes in, but Peter or James who told him that there is something called God, and he believes it after the fashion of Euripides. O Jupiter, of whom I know nothing but thy name. Footnote. Plutarch. It is thus that the tragedy of Manalippus originally began, but the clamor of the Athenians compelled Euripides to change these opening lines. And footnote. We hold that no child who dies before the age of reason will be deprived of everlasting happiness. The Catholics believe the same of all children who have been baptized, even though they have never heard of God. There are, therefore, circumstances in which one can be saved without belief in God, and these circumstances occur in the case of children or madmen, when the human mind is incapable of the operations necessary to perceive the Godhead. The only difference I see between you and me is that you profess that children of seven years old are able to do this, and I do not think them ready for it at fifteen. Whether I am right or wrong depends not on an article of the creed, but on a simple observation of natural history. From the same principle, it is plain that any man having reached old age without faith in God will not, therefore, be deprived of God's presence in another life if his blindness was not willful. And I maintain that it is not always willful. You admit that it is so in the case of lunatics, deprived by disease of their spiritual faculties, but not of their manhood, and therefore still entitled to the goodness of their creator. Why, then, should we not admit it in the case of those brought up from infancy in seclusion, those who have led the life of a savage and are without the knowledge that comes from intercourse with other men? Footnote for the natural condition of the human mind and its slow development. See the first part of the discourse, see inegalite. End footnote. For it is clearly impossible that such a savage should ever raise his thoughts to the knowledge of the true God. Reason tells that man should only be punished for his willful faults, and that invincible ignorance can never be imputed to him as a crime. Hence it follows that in the sight of the eternal justice every man who would believe, if he had the necessary knowledge, is counted a believer, 
and that there would be no unbelievers to be punished except those who have closed their hearts against the truth let us beware of proclaiming the truth to those who cannot as yet comprehend it for to do so is to try to inculcate error it would be better to have no idea at all of the divinity than to have mean grotesque harmful and unworthy ideas to fail to perceive the divine is a lesser evil than to insult it the worthy plutarch says i would rather men said there is no such person as plutarch than that they should say plutarch is unjust envious jealous and such a tyrant that he demands more than can be performed the chief harm which results from the monstrous ideas of god which are instilled into the minds of children is that they last all their life long and as men they understand no more of god than they did as children in switzerland i once saw a good and pious mother who was so convinced of the truth of this maxim that she refused to teach her son religion when he was a little child for fear lest he should be satisfied with this crude teaching and neglect a better teaching when he reached the age of reason this child never heard the name of god pronounced except with reverence and devotion and as soon as he attempted to say the word he was told to hold his tongue as if the subject were too sublime and great for him this reticence aroused his curiosity and his self-love he looked forward to the time when he would know this mystery so carefully hidden from him the less they spoke of god to him the less he was himself permitted to speak of god the more he thought about him this child beheld god everywhere what i should most dread as a result of this unwise affectation of mystery is this by overstimulating the youth's imagination you may turn his head and make him at the best a fanatic rather than a believer but we need fear nothing of the sort for emile who always declines to pay attention to what is beyond his reach and listens with profound indifference to things he does not understand there are so many things to which he is accustomed to say that is of no concern of mine that one more or less makes no difference to him and when he does begin to perplex himself with these great matters it is because the natural growth of his knowledge is turning his thoughts that way we have seen the road by which the cultivated human mind approaches these mysteries and i am ready to admit that it would not attain to them naturally even in the bosom of society till a much later age but as there are in this same society inevitable causes which hasten the development of the passions if we did not also hasten the development of the knowledge which controls these passions we should indeed depart from the path of nature and disturb her equilibrium when we can no longer restrain a precocious development in one direction we must promote a corresponding development in another direction so that the order of nature may not be inverted and so that things should progress together not separately so that the man complete at every moment of his life may never find himself at one stage in one of his faculties and at another stage in another faculty what a difficulty do i see before me a difficulty all the greater because it depends less on actual facts than on the cowardice of those who dare not look the difficulty in the face let us at least venture to state our problem the child should always be brought up in his father's religion he is always given plain proofs that this religion whatever it may be is the only true religion that all others are ridiculous and absurd the force of the argument depends entirely on the country in which it is put forward let a turk who thinks christianity so absurd at constantinople come to paris and see what they think of mohammed it is in matters of religion more than in anything else that prejudice is triumphant but when we who profess to shake off its yoke entirely we who refuse to yield any homage to authority decline to teach a meal anything which he could not learn for himself in any country what religion shall we give him 
to what sect shall this child of nature belong the answer strikes me as quite easy we will not attach him to any sect but we will give him the means to choose for himself according to the right use of his own reason in sido per ignes suppositos ceneri deloso horace lib two od one no matter thus far zeal and prudence have taken the place of caution i hope that these guardians will not fail me now reader do not fear lest i should take precautions unworthy of a lover of truth i shall never forget my motto but i distrust my own judgment all too easily instead of telling you what i think myself i will tell you the thoughts of one whose opinions carry more weight than mine I guarantee the truth of the facts I am about to relate. They actually happen to the author whose writings I am about to transcribe. It is for you to judge whether we can draw from them any considerations bearing on the matter in hand. I do not offer you my own idea or another's as your rule. I merely present them for your examination. Thirty years ago there was a young man in an Italian town. He was an exile from his native land and found himself reduced to the depths of poverty. He had been born a Calvinist, but the consequence of his own folly had made him a fugitive in a strange land. He had no money and he changed his religion for a morsel of bread. There was a hostile for proselytes in that town to which he gained admission. The study of controversy inspired doubts he had never felt before and he made acquaintance with evil hitherto unsuspected by him he heard strange doctrines and he met with morals still stranger to him he beheld this evil conduct and nearly fell a victim to it he longed to escape but he was locked up he complained but his complaints were unheeded at the mercy of his tyrants he found himself treated as a criminal because he would not share their crimes the anger kindled in a young and untried heart by the first experience of violence and injustice may be realized by those who have themselves experienced it tears of anger flowed from his eyes he was wild with rage he prayed to heaven and to man and his prayers were unheard he spoke to every one and no one listened to him he saw no one but the vilest servants under the control of the wretched who insulted him or accomplices in the same crime who laughed at his resistance and encouraged him to follow their example he would have been ruined had not a worthy priest visited the hostel on some matter of business he found an opportunity of consulting him secretly the priest was poor and in need of help himself but the victim had more need of his assistance and he did not hesitate to help him to escape at the risk of making a dangerous enemy having escaped from vice to return to poverty the young man struggled vainly against fate for a moment he thought he had gained the victory at the first gleam of good fortune his woes and his protector were alike forgotten he was soon punished for his ingratitude all his hopes vanished youth indeed was on his side but his romantic ideas spoiled everything he had neither talent nor skill to make his way easily he could neither be commonplace nor wicked he expected so much that he got nothing when he had sunk to his former poverty when he was without food or shelter and ready to die of hunger he remembered his benefactor he went back to him found him and was kindly welcomed the sight of him reminded the priest of a good deed he had done such a memory always rejoices the heart this man was by nature humane and pitiful he felt the sufferings of others through his own and his heart had not hardened by prosperity in a word the lessons of wisdom and an enlightened virtue had reinforced his natural kindness of heart he welcomed the young man found him a lodging and recommended him he shared with him his living which was barely enough for two he did more he instructed him consoled him and taught him the difficult art of bearing adversity in patience you prejudiced people would you have expected to find all this in a priest 
and in Italy? This worthy priest was a poor Savoyard clergyman who had offended his bishop by some youthful fault. He had crossed the Alps to find a position which he could not obtain in his own country. He lacked neither wit nor learning, and with this interesting countenance he had met with patrons who found him a place in the household of one of the ministers as tutor to his son. He preferred poverty to dependence, and he did not know how to get on with the great. He did not stay long with this minister, but when he departed he took with him his good opinion, and as he lived a good life, and gained the hearts of everybody, he was glad to be forgiven by his bishop, and to obtain from him a small parish among the mountains, where he might pass the rest of his life. This was the limit of his ambition. He was attracted by the young fugitive, and he questioned him closely. He saw that ill fortune had already seared his heart, that scorn and disgrace had overthrown his courage, and that his pride, transformed into bitterness and spite, led him to see nothing in the harshness and injustice of men but their evil disposition and the vanity of all virtue. He had seen that religion was but a mask for selfishness, and its holy services but a screen for hypocrisy. He had found in the subtleties of empty disputations heaven and hell awarded as prizes for mere words. He had seen the sublime and primitive idea of divinity disfigured in the vain fancies of men, and when, as he thought, faith in God required him to renounce the reason God himself had given him, he held in equal scorn our foolish imaginings and the object with which they are concerned, with no knowledge of things as they are without any idea of their origins, he was immersed in his stubborn ignorance and utterly despised those who thought they knew more than himself. The neglect of all religion soon leads to the neglect of a man's duties. The heart of this young libertine was already far on this road, yet his was not a bad nature, though incredulity and misery were gradually stifling his natural disposition and dragging him down to ruin they were leading him into the conduct of a rascal and the morals of an atheist the almost inevitable evil was not actually consummated the young man was not ignorant his education had not been neglected he was at that happy age when the pulse beats strongly and the heart is warm but is not yet enslaved by the madness of the senses. His heart had not lost its elasticity. A native modesty, a timid disposition restrained him, and prolonged for him that period during which you watch your pupils so carefully. The hateful example of brutal depravity, a vice without any charm, had not merely failed to quicken his imagination, it had deadened it for a long time disgust rather than virtue preserved his innocence which would only succumb to more seductive charms the priest saw the danger and the way of escape he was not discouraged by difficulties he took a pleasure in his task he determined to complete it and to restore to virtue the victim he had snatched from vice he set about it cautiously the beauty of the motive gave him courage and inspired him with means worthy of his zeal. Whatever might be the result, his pains would not be wasted. We are always successful when our sole aim is to do good. He began to win the confidence of the proselyte by not asking any price for his kindness, by not intruding himself upon him, by not preaching at him by always coming down to his level and treating him as an equal. It was, so I think, a touching sight to see a serious person become the comrade of a young scamp, and virtue putting up with the speech of license in order to triumph over it more completely. When the young fool came to him with his silly confidences and opened his heart to him, the priest listened and set him at ease, without giving his approval to what was bad. He took an interest in everything. No tactless reproof checked his chatter or closed his heart. 
the pleasure which he thought was given by his conversation increased his pleasure in telling everything thus he made his general confession without knowing he was confessing anything after he had made a thorough study of his feelings and disposition the priest saw plainly that although he was not ignorant for his age he had forgotten everything that he most needed to know and that the disgrace which fortune had brought upon him had stifled in him all real sense of good and evil there is a stage of degradation which robs the soul of its life and the inner voice cannot be heard by one whose whole mind is bent on getting food to protect the unlucky youth from the moral death which threatened him he began to revive his self-love and his good opinion of himself he showed him a happier future in the right use of his talents he revived the generous warmth of his heart by stories of the noble deeds of others by rousing his admiration for the doers of the deeds he revived his desire to do like deeds himself to draw him gradually from his idle and wandering life he made him copy out extracts from well-chosen books he pretended to want these extracts and so nourished in him the noble feeling of gratitude he taught him indirectly through these books and thus he made him sufficiently regain his good opinion of himself so that he would no longer think himself good for nothing and would not make himself despicable in his own eyes a trifling incident will show how this kindly man tried unknown to him to raise the heart of his disciple out of its degradation without seeming to think of teaching the priest was so well known for his uprightness and his discretion that many people preferred to entrust their alms to him rather than to the wealthy clergy of the town one day someone had given him some money to distribute among the poor and the young man was mean enough to ask for some of it on the score of poverty no he said we are brothers you belong to me and i must not touch the money entrusted to me then he gave him the sum he had asked for out of his own pocket lessons of this sort seldom fail to make an impression on the heart of young people who are not wholly corrupt i am weary of speaking in the third person and the precaution is unnecessary for you are well aware my dear friend that i myself was this unhappy fugitive i think i am so far removed from the disorders of my youth that i may venture to confess them and the hand which rescued me well deserves that i should at least do honor to its goodness at the cost of some slight shame what struck me most was to see in the private life of my worthy master virtue without hypocrisy humanity without weakness speech always plain and straightforward and conduct in accordance with this speech i never saw him trouble himself whether those whom he assisted went to vespers or confession whether they fasted at the appointed seasons and went without meat nor did he impose upon them any other like conditions without which you might die of hunger before you could hope for any help from the devout far from displaying before him the zeal of a new convert i was encouraged by these observations and i made no secret of my way of thinking nor did he seem to be shocked by it sometimes i would say to myself he overlooks my indifference to the religion i have adopted because he sees i am equally indifferent to the religion in which i was brought up he knows that my scorn for religion is not confined to one sect but what could i think when i sometimes heard him give his approval to doctrines contrary to those of the roman catholic church and apparently having but a poor opinion of its ceremonies i should have thought him a protestant in disguise if i had not beheld him so faithful to those very customs which he seemed to value so lightly but i knew he fulfilled his priestly duties as carefully in private as in public and i knew not what to think of those apparent contradictions except for the fault which had formerly brought about his disgrace a fault which he had only partially overcome his life was exemplary his conduct beyond reproach his conversation honest and discreet 
while i lived on very friendly terms with him i learned day by day to respect him more and when he had completely won my heart by such great kindness i awaited with eager curiosity the time when i should learn what was the principle on which the uniformity of this strange life was based this opportunity was a long time coming before taking his disciple into his confidence he tried to get the seeds of reason and kindness which he had sown in my heart to germinate the most difficult fault to overcome in me was a certain haughty misanthropy a certain bitterness against the rich and successful as if their wealth and happiness had been gained at my own expense and as if their supposed happiness had been unjustly taken from my own the foolish vanity of youth which kicks against the pricks of humiliation made me only too much inclined to this angry temper and the self-respect which my mentor strove to revive led to pride which made men still more vile in my eyes and only added scorn to my hatred without directly attacking this pride he prevented it from developing into hardness of heart and without depriving me of my self-esteem he made me less scornful of my neighbors by continually drawing my attention from the empty show and directing it to the genuine sufferings concealed by it he taught me to deplore the faults of my fellows and feel for their sufferings to pity rather than envy them touched with compassion towards human weaknesses through the profound conviction of his own failings he viewed all men as the victims of their own vices and those of others he beheld the poor groaning under the tyranny of the rich and the rich under the tyranny of their own prejudices believe me said he our illusions far from concealing our woes only increase them by giving value to what is in itself valueless in making us aware of all sorts of fancied privations which we should not otherwise feel peace of heart consists in despising everything that might disturb that peace the man who clings most closely to life is the man who can least enjoy it the man who most eagerly desires happiness is always most miserable what gloomy ideas i exclaimed bitterly if we must deny ourselves everything we might as well never have been born and if we must despise even happiness itself who can be happy i am replied the priest one day in a tone which made a great impression on me you happy so little favored by fortune so poor in exile and persecuted you are happy how are you contrived to be happy my child he answered i will gladly tell you thereupon he explained that having heard my confessions he would confess to me i will open my whole heart to yours he said embracing me you will see me if not as i am at least as i seem to myself when you have heard my whole confession of faith when you really know the condition of my heart you will know why i think myself happy and if you think as i do you will know how to be happy too but these explanations are not the affair of a moment it will take time to show you all my ideas about the lot of man and the true value of life let us choose a fitting time and a place where we may continue this conversation without interruption i showed him how eager i was to hear him the meeting was fixed for the very next morning it was summer time we rose at daybreak he took me out of the town on to a high hill above the river po whose course we beheld as it flowed between its fertile banks in the distance the landscape was crowned by the vast chain of the alps the beams of the rising sun already touched the plains and cast across the fields long shadows of trees hillocks and houses and enriched with a thousand gleams of light the fairest picture which the human eye can see you would have thought that nature was displaying all her splendor before our eyes to furnish a text for our conversation after contemplating this scene for a space in silence the man of peace spoke to me 
End of Book 4